Hi and welcome to the Journalism Salute. I'm Mark Simon. In each episode, we'll talk to or about an interesting person or organization related to journalism. The intent is to show that journalists are not the enemy of the people. Thank you for listening. On today's show, we're joined by Robin Kemp, the founder of the Clayton Crescent in Clayton County, Georgia. Robin is a writer, photographer, and videographer with more than 30 years of journalism experience. She was a news writer and field producer at CNN in the 1990s and a ticker producer at the Weather Channel in the 2010s. Her work is an eclectic mix. She lists author and poet on her LinkedIn page back to back with crime and safety reporter. If you paid attention to Twitter in the last few months, you'd know Robin is someone who documented the presidential election count in Clayton County for 21 consecutive hours. But now that the election is over and Joe Biden has been inaugurated, I wanted to ask the question, what's next? So let's learn about Robin and her project, the Clayton Crescent, claytoncrescent.org. Robin, thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Mark. All right, so my last guest was a 22-year-old college grad just starting out, and I asked her for her first journalism memory, anything associated with journalism in any way. So I want to contrast that with someone who's a little older. What's yours? Well, this is really tricky because I I like to tell people I've been in the news business since I was in utero. Uh, My dad was a journalist for half a century and uh, started out, you know, at the the Galveston Daily News and the the radio station down there and stringing for the Houston, I think for the Chronicle. I'm not sure if he was for the Chronicle or the Post. He may have been doing both. He was a Capitol reporter and he was stringing for, I believe for Life Magazine, all these, he was all over the place. And then he wound up going to New Orleans when the mafia ran him out of Galveston for covering some stuff and uh, wound up at WDSU, the NBC affiliate down there in the 60s. And I was born in New Orleans. So um, I've always, always, it's always been there. It's, it's not ever not been there. So some of my favorite early memories though, or, you know, I remember being really little and seeing my dad anchor. He didn't anchor all the time, but sometimes he would anchor and seeing him on the TV and going up to the screen and, and saying, I love you, daddy, and kissing the screen, you know. <laughs> Um, talking to him and my mom's like, he can't hear you. He's on TV. (laughs) Um, Or going to the new, I would beg my mom every single day. We would go and pick up my dad after the the six o'clock newscast was over. And he was like the managing editor and the news director and all these other things along the way at, at WVUE in New Orleans. And I would beg, I would have like these big fights with my mom every night about, I want to go inside and pick up dad. I want to go in the newsroom and pick up dad. And if I was sick, I wanted dad to take me to work with him. <laughs> and, you know, so I would like rip copy and, and monitor the scanners and do all those kinds of things. And sometimes in the middle of the night, if he didn't wake up, my job was to go to the fire beeper and then get on the list of cameramen on the wall in the kitchen and go down the list. I mean, that was my instruction, go down the list until someone says yes. And the first two would always say no, like, hell no, I'm not, the boss's kid is calling me a tenant and I'm not going anywhere, right? And finally (laughs) somebody would go. So it's just always been there. And I grew up reading, you know, the Columbia Journalism Review and I was aspiring to that, that kind of stuff when I was a little kid. So, and of course it was like, you know, Time and Newsweek and every newspaper you could throw a stick at, every news magazine in the world, you know, we had them all and that's what I read. So I guess from last week, Morgan uh, detailed how her first journalism experience was with Time for Kids. Uh, And I'm curious, uh, what was your first journalism experience and what made you think, hey, I can be pretty good at this? Well, you know, when you're like uh, an 11 year old girl, you, you love horses. So, of course, I I and all my little friends had briar horses, and we hung around and mucked out the stables for a free ride, and um, and there was a magazine in the 70s called Horse of Course, and it was for, it was aimed at, at, you know, girls or kids who had horses, right, but of course, everybody who wanted a horse had this subscription also, Um, and so I, I created 
there was this new thing called a Xerox machine down at the public library. So I create on the side, I was like making little, you know, accessories for the briar horses and peddling to my friends for a quarter or whatever. But I went down to this modern fan machine and did the horse of course newsletter, which I think ran about three or four issues, which is basically me and a pencil and two sides of a piece of typing paper and, <laughs> you know, writing the, writing the stories and drawing the pictures and then printing them out on the Xerox machine and then selling them to my friends. <laughs> <laughs> I did the same with a baseball newsletter at about the same age. <laughs> I love it. That's yep, it, that's, that's how everyone kind of gets started. All right. All right. So now we fast forward, and this is going to come in a bit of a disjointed order because your career is okay. long, but I want to hit kind of one of the more notable aspects of it first, uh, and that's uh, that you were working for a newspaper in Clayton County. They laid you off, and you started your own site, and the site was you. Uh, what went into putting it all together that set up everything that has happened since? Well, what happened was I had been out of the news business for a number of years because I, I was at CNN. I, I kind of have to back up to tell this story. I was at CNN from 89 to 96, and it was the greatest job ever, really. I mean, it's probably the best job I will ever have in my life or ever. Like, nothing can top that. It was a special time and place back when Ted still owned it. So I did grad school full-time and CNN full-time for a year. And the problem was this, uh, my academic background is in poetry. So switching gears all the time between two really different kinds of super concentrated writing, you know, news writing for television is extremely, extremely condensed. And you have to put a lot into, you know, a sentence, a single sentence or a couple of sentences. Uh, and then you, that's all nonfiction. That's all you know, reality, believe it or not. Some people don't believe it. And then you have to switch gears and go completely 180 to it's all out of your head. It's all creative. And, you know, yeah, of course, there are aspects of reality that in which you base your metaphors and things like that. But it's a different kind of writing. And I just found it really extremely difficult to switch between those two. Now, there were fiction writers who worked at CNN. They didn't have any problem switching back and forth, but this was different. And I couldn't, you know, shut off the day's news and do what I needed to do. And I said, okay, I'm just going to, I'm just going to take a break. I'm going to, you know, take a year or two off. I'm going to finish my MFA. And, you know, I can always get back on the merry-go-round, I said. And, you know, I was leaving and, and somebody's like, ah, oh, yeah, you'll be back. And I said, no, I won't. I won't. They're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> sure. Yeah, you won't be back. And uh, so I did that and I, what happened? Uh, I started at Warren, well, you don't care about all the grad school stuff. Long story short, I did some time at one grad program. It was a super bad fit. And I went to another graduate school program at the University of New Orleans where I was much happier and finished up my MFA there. And, uh, then I got into, well, I guess I need to start teaching. So I'm adjuncting, right? And I knew there wasn't a whole lot to be had in New Orleans in terms of teaching jobs for English majors. So I went back to Atlanta where there were lots of colleges and universities everywhere you spit. And I adjuncted around for a few years. I was teaching six classes, three on one side of town, three on the other side of town, all, all on a part-time basis. Now, a full-time load is four courses a semester. Okay, that's like what tenure track people teach that or less if they have other duties. So I was teaching six entry level comp courses, which is like the meat grinder from hell for academics. <laughs> and I, I worked myself into bed for a year. I was too sick. I couldn't, I had no health coverage. I had nothing. I mean, literally living in my parents' basement and uh, until I got my health back. And at that point, you know, somebody kind of twisted my arm into going to get a PhD that I really didn't want to get since I already had a terminal degree, but I went ahead and did the program anyway. And that was like more of the same. It was like doing your MFA all over again with a couple of lit classes that you didn't take. And it's really, I don't, I just didn't want to stay. I love teaching, but I was not going to do it under those circumstances. So I started looking around for news jobs and doing some freelance videography and things like that. And uh, I'm skipping a couple of other jobs in between, but eventually I, I wound up 
calling up the, the Clayton News Daily, which is now called the Clayton News because they only come out in print once a week, um, and saying, hey, you know, I live down here. Uh, I have this background. I think I could help you guys out a lot. Would you be interested in me? Could I do some freelancing for you or something? They said, yeah, sure, we'll try you. And so Alice Queen was kind enough to hire me and give me an assignment. And I, you know, she liked what she saw and she hired me full time. And so I became the crime and safety reporter for the Clayton News. And I also was doing essentially the same gig at the Henry Herald, which is the next county over and it's owned by the same company. And I was also covering the local government meetings as many as I could over here. So the problem with Clayton County is it's a logistical nightmare. Clayton County is cut into seven municipalities, all of which have their own jurisdictions. So I'm not sure that everybody has their own police department, they may, but you're talking about seven city councils and seven you know, collections of boards, you know, everybody has a zoning board, everybody has a development authority, you know, I think everybody has a police department. This, yeah, sure, I believe they all have police departments. Then there's the county police department, but then there's also the county sheriff's office and the board of commissioners and all of the county level boards, and there are probably about 12 or 15 county level boards. You, there's no way one person can cover it all is the upshot, but I do my best to hit the high points. And that's all anybody can do. So when COVID-19 struck, I had been at the paper for two years and I was having a blast, you know, doing my thing and, you know, killing it and beating all the locals on like 99% of the coverage that I did. I would do stuff and it would appear in everybody's morning show the next day. So I would do stuff and it would appear in everybody's morning show the next day. And I was a happy camper. And then with COVID-19, uh, on top of the, the other issues that newspapers all over the country are facing at the local level, uh, it just got really bad. Because if you're the, the one and only county paper and you're getting all of the legals, okay, that sounds like a really good, sweet deal for you, except when the legals stop. So what happened in Clayton County was the state of Georgia issued a judicial emergency order, which really stopped a lot of court proceedings, right? So that cut into some things. Um, people stopped buying houses. So there weren't a whole lot of those classifieds coming in either. And worst of all, well, I mean, it wasn't worst of all, you know, morally speaking, but in terms of income for the back of the paper, the evictions stopped, okay? So it was great if you were in danger of losing your home, but it was really bad because all of these, you know, real estate sales, all of these, foreclosures, all of that was put on hold. And that was like a big fat part of the back of the paper for a long time because the economy hasn't been super great down here. And because there's a lot of people who buy property who don't live here and you know they let it go and then the development authorities snatch it up. So that was a booming business that kind of went away. And so Eventually, I, I survived the first round. Uh, a couple people got cut and left me as the sole reporter at the paper over there. And well, there, there's like one and a half people at each paper was what happened. And then I got cut in April. And my boss calls me at nine in the morning because I, mean, I get up a little bit later because I, I work nights. I go to these meetings and stuff. She calls me at nine in the morning. I'm still in bed. She's like, I got some bad news. I'm like, oh, great. So I knew where this was going. And we talked. And then a few minutes later, I got off the phone, walked into my home office, opened up my computer, and found a, a web template and started the Clayton Crescent. All right. So that's how it happened. So from there, um, you're not a political site. You're a hyper local site. And your coverage is on missing people, sidewalk repair, drug busts. Uh, up until November 3rd, what was the biggest thing you had covered? Oh, I can't, I couldn't even tell you. <laughs> it's all been like one long day since April. I swear to God. Yep. I, um, I think, okay, I know what the biggest thing was. It would have been an incident with the Clayton County police where uh, some kids were messing around with an airsoft gun or a BB gun that was a, a realistic looking weapon. It was like a replica. 
and they were screwing around in a convenience store and waving it around, hee hee ha ha, you know, like 12, 13, 14 year old boys, you know, your brother, right? Except these kids were black. Now my, my brothers did stupid crap when they were that age too, and the police brought them home. But if your child is black and you're black, you don't know if the police are gonna bring your child home alive or dead. So what happened was these kids tossed the gun in the bushes or whatever, and they were walking through a cut by some woods going back to their neighborhood, which was right there. And uh, the store owner called the police and said, hey, you know, these kids were here, they pulled a gun, they were, you know, carrying on out in the parking lot, whatever. So the police came and because they knew that a gun had been involved in the call, that was their concern. Uh, the officer was also black, by the way. And uh, he saw some kids who fit the description. It was them. And, you know, he went up to them and he drew his gun on them. And so the kids are standing there with their hands up and all of the moms and dads from the neighborhood are passing by this main drag because it's like uh, townhouses or apartment. It's townhouses, I think, on one side and school, two schools on the other side. So it's like a neighborhood, right? And people are freaking out. They're stopping their cars. They're getting out. They're yelling at the cop. They're you know, pull out their phone and they're, they're recording video and tell them don't shoot, don't shoot and telling the kids to do this and do that. And the cop is trying to keep everybody cool. He's by himself waiting for his backup. And so it was a huge controversy and a really big story that really inflamed a lot of passions around here. And that was, that was the biggest story. And that's, I think what, like moving forward, those are the kinds of things that you, that you'll likely be covering, but, but yeah. now let's go back. Let's go back to November. Uh, and just, I know you've talked about this on a number of uh, things. I heard you on NPR. Uh, I've heard you in a number of places. Just take us through the recount briefly. Uh, what was the strangest thing you saw? And had you ever previously com covered something that required that kind of stamina? Well, actually, that was the first count, the, the real long 21 hour one. That was the actual January 5th election night count. And what it was, was the rest of the country or <laughs> certainly most of Georgia had their, their results in. And for whatever reason, Clayton was still counting. And so I, I had no idea. I was only, I was solely focused on what was going on in Clayton County. Uh, what were the numbers for this and that local election, you know, and whoever won for president was going to be a gimme, like, you know, whether it was Trump or Biden, you know, okay, fine, you know, I'll just repeat that. But I'm really focused on these local races because there were a whole bunch, it was a real long ballot. And that's part of why it took so long for them to count. So I was there early and there was some Republican observer there. And, you know, he's, he's like a young Republican kid and you know, he's, a, he's a grown man, but he's young. Uh, and as time passed, more of these, people came in and they, they came in in increasing numbers and in an increasing state of agitation. And they would make comments about, oh, I think I saw some ballot commingling over there. And, oh, I, I don't know, you know, I, I can't see the signatures from here. I can't see, there's no signatures to see, okay? <laughs> so you don't even know what you're looking at. So eventually a fairly, a very high level operative, a guy, uh, from Virginia came in and there were other people who said that they were there from the national Trump campaign or that they were with the David Perdue campaign, the Senate campaign. Uh, and they were apparently, they appeared to me to be giving these kids instructions for what to look for or what to say or do, or I have no way, I'm speculating here, okay? But that was the impression I got. And then they would come back in and they would start complaining or they would like, very blatantly pull out the camera and start videotaping in an area where they were not allowed to and making a big scene. It was almost like they were trying to get thrown out, some of them, um, or just kind of trying to, to make allegations, throw them to the wall and see what sticks. And a couple of times I overheard whatever their complaint was and I've just straight up walked up to them and said, okay, so you said you saw ballot coming like, can you describe exactly what you saw oh i can't do that you know like, I, I can't i can't comment on that and that was the universal answer okay so after a while it became fairly clear that you know if they had a legitimate complaint that they probably would have wanted to air it immediately and 
you know, had they been Democrats, I would have done the same exact thing. I would have walked straight up to him and said, so, okay, so you're, you say you saw this, can you describe exactly what you saw? It's not for me to pass judgment on it. I'm just looking for the information to let other people make, you know, they can decide whether they believe it or not, but they didn't want to just even talk about it, which I found extraordinarily strange since there were so many of them that were so invested in being in Clayton County, which is like something close to 80% Democratic. So you knew it was always going to go for Biden anyway. Uh, that wasn't a question. So what exactly are you complaining about? If Do you see cheating? Well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about that. They didn't want to talk about it. So, I mean, I can only infer from that that they, they didn't see what they said they saw or they were mistaken. So it, it went on for hours and hours. And I was the only one in there who was a reporter, except early, like around the middle of the day, there was a crew from a Norwegian news organization called Afton Posten. There was a reporter and a photographer and another reporter or producer, perhaps. And we interviewed this guy, Manuel Iglesias, who was from that, that Republican Lawyers, National Republican Lawyers Association or Republican National Lawyers Association, uh, who seemed to be the, the big lawyer giving directions to all of these people. Uh, as the evening progressed, more and more of them came in. That what happened was that if you want to be an election observer, you can, you can do it one of two ways. You can do it at the county level or you can do it at the state level. And so a lot of people come in from out of state and they're authorized by their political party or their, you know, in the case of something like the ACLU or some third party group, the Carter Center they may be authorized to go statewide. So what happened was, and I got this from a, two Democrats who were you know, involved in observing elections. They said what happened is that they, they brought these folks in from basically Savannah area, uh, or at least East, East Georgia, they brought them in. And that's why they kept coming in because they got done or whatever over there, or they got the word to come to Clayton County, which none of them had ever set foot in before. And, or maybe a couple of them had. Uh, and there were like 12 people in this little space that was marked off and had two chairs in it to start with, which made me think it was for two people at a time. Uh, and it got really full and crazy and the elections people were just as nonchalant as they could be. They were like, you know, whatever. We're just sitting here counting, 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 counting. And I give them a lot of credit because they were being really calm and just focusing on the task at hand, which was the most important thing. Everything else was ancillary. Around three, no, around, I think it was like 10 or 11 at night, I get this phone call. And, and the whole time I've been like documenting who was coming in, taking photographs of each of these people, because I said, boy, this is weird. Let me just start seeing who these people are. Click, click, click. And some of them, of course, got mad. They didn't want their picture taken. Well, too bad. You're at a public building. We're dealing with an election. Uh, so I'm tweeting this out and saying, oh, here's, here's some more observers. Oh, here's some more observers. Oh, here's some people over here putting things in the printer or the, the scanner to count. And for some reason, the rest of the universe started following this because it was so late relative the, uh, to the rest of the count. Well, I didn't know that. I was just feeding the beast. I wasn't reading any of this stuff. I didn't know people were commenting. I wasn't paying attention to that. I thought like five journalists in Atlanta I knew were looking at the thing, maybe, you know, or maybe my mom or somebody. And I get this phone call like 11 at night and it's someone from Leading Britain's Conversation in London. And they want to know, can I go on in a couple of minutes? I said, okay, you know, give me a second. I'll go out to my car where it's quiet. And I went out to my car and I locked the door and did a beeper with them. And I thought it was very strange. Like, you know, they're asking me these big questions about, you know, American politics in general. And I'm trying to answer them. And that was it, you know. Um, so I go back in and I check my feed and it's going nuts. And I was like, oh my God, this is craziness. 
but I kept on tweeting. And I think I might have responded to a couple people, but I just couldn't, I couldn't even, I couldn't, I just couldn't get into that. So the night progressed around 3 a.m. or so. This is still going on. And and I'm, you know, the, the sole person there from the press and have been for hours. And finally, thank God, here come the local TV crews finally to do the morning hits. And everybody started setting up and they took up all the space. And the beauty of it, okay. If you're a print reporter, you can kind of blend in, especially if you don't have like a camera with a long lens. As we all know, you know, sometimes you want to travel more discreetly. And I had my long lens for a reason. I wanted people to know I was with the press. Uh, when the big cameras, the, the video cameras came in, the pro cams, they all left. They ran. I mean, not literally, but they rushed out the door. They did not want to be on TV and they disappeared. So I was very happy to have some backup because it was, it seemed a little dicey at that point. And they were all doing their hits in this little narrow hallway. And a couple of the guys were like, hey, have you checked your GoFundMe? I'm like, what GoFundMe? They said, hey, go on, check your GoFundMe. Go on, check it, check it. I said, well, all right. I said, well, I had a GoFundMe in like April, but that's <laughs> over. That's dead. That's been done, you know? Uh, so I open it up and I, I look at my GoFundMe and there's like, you know, $8,400 in there. I'm like, what? And they were laughing. They loved it. They thought it was great. And I, I thought, this is really amazing, you know, and it was coming from people all over that I'd never heard of or met, people from all over the country. And they're like, thank you, thank you, thank you. And some of them were lavishing this extravagant praise on me and saying stuff like, oh, you saved democracy. <laughs> saved democracy? I didn't save democracy, man. I was just down here. And, and they, people, they just kept giving. I, <laughs> and it wound up being something like almost $40,000 at the end. You know, I mean, and not now you're much, funded. But eventually, and now I'm funded. Yep. And it, it was great, but it was also frightening because I didn't have a 501c3 in place yet. I had thought ahead about that. I had contacted uh, Institute for Nonprofit News, knowing at a certain point that I may need to, you know, set something up. And they were like, oh, no, no, you did something in the wrong order. No, no, no. Come back when you get it together. Oh, great. Thanks for help. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, INN. It was, it was on me, not on you. Um, so I was you know, kind of focusing on the day-to-day -day grind and going, well, I need to, I need to do this 501c3 paperwork. I need to do this 501c3 paperwork. I don't know when I'm going to have time to do it. And an angel from heaven, okay, by the name of Richard Griffiths, who is a, a producer and editor I used to work with at CNN, who was just immediately the past president of the Georgia First Amendment Foundation, and who understands and has a ton of experience with all the world of nonprofit came down to help me just out of the kindness of his heart. He and his wife, Debbie, who is a CPA. Yay. Yay. Like, <laughs> Everything <laughs> fell into place. He thought it couldn't get any better. Okay. It yep. was even better. Uh, so they have been instrumental in getting things up and running and helping me get a board together and helping me find a lawyer who would file paperwork for a pauper of a writer and, you know, stuff like that. So uh, our other board member is Tammy Joyner, who is a longtime resident of Clayton County and who is a journalist who has worked for, she's been published all over, but she mainly recently worked for the AJC. And she is now working for a new nonprofit, a whole other new nonprofit that's run by Maria Supporta from Supporter Report. Uh, they're covering, I think, I believe they're more business oriented, but they're covering things that I guess the supporter report isn't doing. I don't know. Uh, and then we have another person coming on board soon, and we can't really say who that is just yet because that person has to take care of some other business first. But, it's but now, going in now, the right now you really fully, you're, you're fully invested now. Yeah. Um, what, do you, what do you want the, the, all right, so now you have the Clayton Crescent, uh, and you're not going to be covering uh, presidential elections, at least for four years. Uh, what do you want the what do you want what do you want the crescent to be? Um, I I really want it to be uh, uh, that good local news site that everybody can count on that can use multimedia and be nimble. And what I would like the Clayton Crescent to be is the the Texas Tribune, basically. That's ambitious. 
I, I mean, that would be nice. That would be really nice. Texas Tribune covers all of Texas, so maybe not so big, but of that ilk. Another nonprofit news organization that I am madly in love with and support uh, financially out of my little skinny pocket is uh, uh, another really excellent news site that is a nonprofit news site that I support personally is The Lens in New Orleans. Uh, they do investigative journalism. So perhaps it's the goal here is to be sort of a, a hybrid of the Texas Tribune and the lens because Clayton County has a large enough population and a, a, an, imp an important enough role in the larger economy of Metro Atlanta and really the East Coast uh, that everything that comes with that requires investigative reporting on the regular. So that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to build that so it will be here for the future. So, you know, I'm not gonna be here forever, you know? I mean, one day I'll die or move on or something, but I want it to be in self-sustaining and in good hands and, and loaded for bear with people who know what they're doing. And I wanna help train some of those people. And so, I, wanna take, I, I, I wanna take some of the lessons that you've learned in your past and see how you're applying them now. Uh, I said this would go in a disjointed order. I wanna go back to CNN briefly. Um, what were you doing for them? And what, what were the biggest things that you took away from that that you can apply now? Uh, my primary job at CNN was as a news writer, which I, I used to say, I make the monkeys talk. <laughs> so I wrote anchor copy. Um, but there's a lot more to it than just writing a couple little lines. For each story that you hear, hear a television anchor reading, um, there is the same amount of research and effort that would have gone into a full story that you had written for a print organization. You still have to go and do the research. And I'm the, I am one who goes to do the research uh, to the point where other people would be annoyed because they're like, ah, oh, you don't need to go look up the background. I'm like, yes, I do. Uh, so I was, I was living in the CNN library a lot of the time and, and you know, digging up background. Uh, that involved working with video editors, uh, choosing cuts for them to cut or writing to video that they had already cut in such a way that, you know, you don't, you don't step on the sound bites and things like that. And for people who don't know what that is, uh, it's when an anchor reads something and then the person in the, the video says exactly the same words. <laughs> That's called stepping on your sound bite. Um, and I, I tried to tune my ear to who was reading the copy. And I like to think that I have a, a really excellent ear for that. So I would write for Bernard Shaw one way, but I would write for Judy Woodruff a completely different way. Because, I, I, you know, I appreciate that you're saying that. Way. Yeah, so that's that's what I would do. And, and in point of fact, most of the anchors at CNN are not like a lot of other anchors. They were, you know, real journalists, like seasoned hard journalists, and mostly wrote their own copy. So, you know, if it was the top of the show and it was the big breaking story, they'd be writing that. Or some, you know, senior writer would be writing that. Um, and we'd be writing everything else. So... That's what I did. I very occasionally got to field produce or work on a special project. Um, and yeah, I enjoyed that. And I, they tried to make me like a line producer and I turned them down. I was like, no, <laughs> no, I don't want to stay in the control room. I, I want to be out in the field. You know, I want to be a field producer. So that when that never happened before I left, I left. That's and funny. had I hung around, I probably would be doing that right now. Segwaying slightly, you were also a ticker producer at the Weather Channel for a year. And when I worked at ESPN, I sat with the ticker folks, who were known as the bottom line. Uh, and then they came and operated uh, adjacent to us. So we got a pretty good look at what they did. And I'm familiar with that world as an observer. And I find it a really interesting job to have because I know there's a lot of automation involved in that. But there's also an importance placed on word choice and getting things uh, exactly right. And I'm curious what your biggest takeaway was from working in a job like that. Well, that was an interesting project um, because I actually launched the very first uh, news ticker on the Weather Channel to air. Um, there was a core group of four of us who were producers, ticker producers around the clock. And uh, so I had a little bit of say in how to build it out. Um, 
I think the most important thing that I got out of that experience in terms of technical stuff was, you know, figure out what you can make easy, figure out how you can not automation isn't exactly the word I'd say, but you know, if you have a system for pulling data and, and you can use that system and, and, you know, day in and day out, use what works, do what works for you. So I was setting up things like uh, I would pull data using various things. I would slap it into, you know, really like a text editor um, and, and put whatever like the city code or the airport codes and the temperatures and all of that. I would just slap that in there. And then I would turn around and cut, paste, cut, paste, cut, paste, cut, paste, cut, paste, you know, because that way I didn't have to worry about it being in there, looking for it, launching it if it were mistaken, any of that stuff. Um, another thing that I, I did that I'm very proud of for the Weather Channel was, uh, you know how they do the outage reports? I invented that. So yeah, I did. <laughs> That's very cool. And, <laughs> Uh, and it's not as easy as it sounds and it's not as accurate. It's not as complete as you would think because um, it was just something that came to me and I, during storm coverage and I said, wow, um, what if we like systematically went around and checked all of the utilities because they have these, these outage maps. Why don't we just get that? And, you know, and I, I brought it to some higher ups and I said, I don't know if we need permission to pull their debt or blah, 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 but it's out there. And, you know, maybe we could, maybe we could come up with a sponsorship for like, you know, Southern company. I don't know, but the, you guys handle that, but I'll, I'll deal with this. Um, and it turned out to be really difficult because if you are with a big monopoly, like Georgia power, you know, or some, company that provides all the power for everybody in several states. Okay, great. They got money. They got an outage map. You go get the data. That's it. Well, <laughs> if you live in an area that is serviced by a co-op, a rural area, okay, they might not even have that kind of information. Or if they have it, they might not put it up for a month. I mean, so you're really, you're really reaching. So what I did was I in cons consultation with my boss at the time, kind of went down a list and said, okay, these are our biggest coverage areas here. We're gonna concentrate on these. Um, and you know, we just, we did the best we could uh, and covered as much territory as we could in any given storm. And I had this big, this insane spreadsheet. And, and I tried to teach other people how to use it, like the other ticker producers. And they got super frustrated because it was just too big and too much. Because you had to go in and manually update every single thing. There wasn't, like the great dream I had was to pull, you know, <laughs> pull from all these sites, some of which didn't exist, right? So then you have to definitely go in and manually put in, you know, Joe Blow Electric Co-op and Podunk, wherever, right? But you theoretically you could pull from the big companies but we did I didn't know if there was like a legal issue with us using their data and you know calling their data so I was like manual everything manual and it took it took exactly an hour to go down the list and update everything and I went state by state and I would do that and I would update these numbers and the producers went nuts they were crazy for this they're like oh my god where can i get some can i get some updated outage numbers <laughs> they're not updating okay they update every hour or they update every 30 minutes i'll check them when they update you know but they went absolutely ape for this stuff and you know i guess viewers liked it and it was useful information and then i'm forever trying to explain to people you have to distinguish between the number of customers that have outages and the number of people who are affected. Because a customer is one bill. You get a bill at your house. If there are other people in your house, there are a lot more people who are affected. So, you know, you might statistically, if you're a, you know, a genius, sit down if you have time and parse out and estimate, you know, a, you know, a factor of five is how many people are really, you know, but that's just speculation and at that point, you know, you're doing an academic exercise. You're not giving out facts. So to say, yes, this many customers are affected. That's helpful. All right. So, so you're a Weather Channel pioneer. Uh, Weather Channel, CNN, Clayton County. 
a uh, lot of things uh, that have happened in your career uh, that are particularly interesting. And I want to take that to our uh, the last portion of the interview, two last questions. Um, the first thing, we always do an advice question. Uh, and for this one, I tried to get a little clever. On your LinkedIn page, it says, Robin Kemp cooks like a Cajun, dives like a dolphin, and works like a warrior. On your Twitter page, it describes you as a spicy Popeye's sandwich out here in a Chick-fil-A world. You're one of my favorite kind of wordsmiths when it comes to writing comparisons, and I have a, a colleague or two that do similar kinds of things. Yours make me laugh, but I get the point too. So what advice would you have to someone regarding being creative in their writing and using that creativity in a journalistic way? Oh, wow. Um, I would urge you to run and read all the Ernest Hemingway you can uh, for concision. And uh, Molly Ivins for tone and humor. And just read everything you get your hands on um, that is bound in a book. And I say that because there's just such a, a volume of pure crap that you can access online. Slow down, take your time, read some, read some good 20th century American literature written by journalists or fiction writers or poets who worked as journalists. Um, study poetry, study the craft of poetry um, because it teaches you how to write in a compressed fashion and it will tune your ear and, and listen to dialect, listen to how people talk, go sit on a bench somewhere one day when people go out in public again. If you can't do that, go on YouTube. I, I recommend highly uh, the documentaries about New Orleans dialect and accent. Uh, if you just go and YouTube anything that says dialect, accent, linguistics, uh, go learn something. Take a linguistics course. Understand how words are put together and how different people put them together. Because the, the conventional wisdom that is really incorrect is that there is quote unquote proper English. There's no such thing, okay? There's standardized English as opposed to standard English, okay? And there are multiple Englishes around the world and, and in the United States. And if you can move past the, the, the grammar phobia and, and just look at it like it's just an instruction manual, that's what it is. But it's also not a Bible. It's not the law. Um, I'm not saying you, you can just like make up stuff anyway, <laughs> but I want you to understand, I want people who, who really are serious about wanting to write to understand whatever their genre is, that um, think of it, think of it the way you would a fiction writer. Think of it like a film, like characters in a film or like characters in a, a novel or a short story. Different characters speak different ways. They don't all speak exactly the same way, right? Well, that reflects, that art is a mirror that we hold up to life. It reflects reality. It's a simulacrum, right? But it, it's, it's meant to show what is really going on in the world. Go out there and listen to people, talk to people. You know, instead of saying, oh, they talk so funny. I don't understand what they're saying. Shut up and listen. That's, that's I mean, that's the that's best the advice. Point, period. You know, shut up and listen. You know, that, it's advice I don't always take as much as I should, but <laughs> shut up and listen. That's, that's good advice. I typically ask here if there's another journalism organization that you'd like to salute, but you've already done that uh, with the Texas Tribune and the New Orleans paper as well. Uh, is there anything else you would like to bring up? I really want to thank everybody who has donated to ClaytonCrescent.org. We do have a new GoFundMe up. We do have a new goal of $100,000. And what I want to do with that money is, you know, basically part of that would finish out the year. We don't quite have enough to finish out our full first year, but we want to use that to, moving forward to establish a base and, and also to hire another person. We need some full-time journalists down here. And I promise you, I'm not making a whole lot of money because 
a lot of what people donated the first time goes to the startup operations. A lot of those are one-time costs and some of them are, you know, moderate ongoing costs for accounting back office stuff is really expensive. Um, the office that we rent is not so expensive, but we, the most expensive thing we pay for is me. And even though I make a very, very, very modest salary, um, I still need health insurance and I have that and dental insurance and I have that. And that's, that's a significant chunk of change out of the donations. We need to, to replicate that to hire another person and then have a little bit left over for ongoing operations. And I really want to emphasize this paid internships. We have tons of colleges around here that, that can feed into this. And I want to train some of these people get them up, get them moving, let them take over down the road. That's really important in this, this area of a population the size of like Philadelphia. Robin Kemp, uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, best of luck with the Clayton Crescent. Oh man, Mark, thank you so much for your time. And it's really nice to meet you. If you watched the presidential inauguration last Wednesday, perhaps like me, you were mesmerized by the poetry of Amanda Gorman. The 22-year-old poet laureate talked about the hill we climb, which both summed up the current situation in America and provided hope for the future. Amanda is a graduate of Harvard University, class of 2020, but is also someone who was shaped by the mentoring of Right Girl. Right Girl is a Los Angeles-based creative writing and mentoring organization that spotlights the power of a girl and her pen. At Right Girl, they match girls with women writers who mentor them in creative writing. Workshops and mentoring sessions explore poetry, fiction, creative nonfiction, songwriting, screenwriting, playwriting, persuasive writing, journal writing, editing, and yes, journalism. As they note, journalists are creative too. Case in point, Robin Kemp. For more information, check out writegirl.org. The Journalism Salute is dedicated to the memory of Dr. Robert Cole, who taught journalism at the College of New Jersey for more than 30 years. Thank you for listening to the Journalism Salute. Please let us know what you think of the show. You can find us on Twitter at JournalismPod, and you can email us at journalismsalute at gmail.com.